Welcome to the finite state machine lectures. Now, before this, we've been talking about like the wide range of what you can expect in robotics. Uh, that there's everything from the physical body to the electronics to the actual AI side. And before this, we've been concentrating on the basis, basics of electronics and getting into controllers and the idea of sensors and effectors and actuators. Now, with sensors, effectors, and actuators, we go on with this for a long time, and I'll be including more lectures in the future that go into a few more of them. But I now want to take a step back and maybe like add more into the actual thinking and controller part and get into what could be considered the minor AI, not really, but minor, where your robot's going to be doing something a little bit more complex, and you need to have a different structure and way that you do your programs other than very basic if statements. So as always, I'll shrink myself down and we'll get started. So boop, 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 and we'll get going. Uh, you're going to get used to seeing even the diagram you see at the top is basically a visual representation of a state diagram. And even what we've been seeing since the beginning of the course of this basic robot control loop is the same idea that steps you're going through. And this one is specifically talking about a closed control loop where you have the feedback from the external environment being brought in, some kind of work being done, then an action and going about and continuously going through this entire process. And remembering that when we're talking about that think kind of step. This is where that planning and classification and learning and lots of other things can be happening. But also it can be like, well, what state is the robot in based upon how should it be reacting and doing its work based on what it knows that's gone on in the environment and having a little bit of memory. And like, how do we keep track of that? And well, if I know this one action has happened, what should I be doing now? And then maybe based upon a sequence of actions, how, what state should the robot be in and how should it be reacting to the environment? So, you know, things like if this was a little robotic car and it just hit a wall, well then before that it was in the state of, well, just keep moving. Well, the next day it got feedback that it, it collided with something. So it should then change into instead of keep moving, it should be, okay, stop and move around obstacle. And you see this idea of a state of moving forwards and then uh, stopping and removing around the obstacle is two different kind of states and actions that have to be done. And you know, like, well, once you're done moving around the obstacle, we should probably keep going back to moving forwards and put in your design. And we have a kind of thing. And so we have to have something that keeps track of it and does this work in a nice way that will scale up and not become this massive nest of if and else's and trying to logically find every single thing you could deal with. So again, we'll be delving more into like the code inside of controllers this time. Uh, we've covered the basics of sensors and analog and digital uh, signals, uh, basics of effectors and actuators with some examples, knowing that there's way more out there and more complex things that you can grow upon. Uh, we haven't touched upon power beyond the fact that you just have to have it plugged in, but in the future, there'll be videos on like how to deal with some of these issues. But now we'll be dealing with more of, again, the brain side, as we've said, like not just the physical hardware of that that we had, you know, like with the controllers, which could be some more complex computer or some other microcontroller, microprocessor, but we're dealing with, well, what's the code inside and how do you start structuring things? Because before this, we've only seen basic things like the code that you're seeing here, which is, you don't need a lot more than this. This is a really quick reactionary kind of robot. And we saw it last time. So if we're looking at the ultrasonic sensor here, and okay, this one's reacting, okay, get a reading from the ultrasonic sensor. If the distance is measuring less than 60 centimeters, okay, we'll then do some computations. Like figure out the angles, in this case, controlling uh, servo. So that's very quick, but that's one state, but that's not the same as a robot that's moving forwards or has to collide and change states and has a lot more complex things it needs to deal with. So even just like this, if we look at now like a robotic little vacuum that's got to move around and it's got to deal with constantly colliding into things, uh, when it reaches detection, the edges of objects, uh, what it's sweeping up, if it's picked up or turned over or flipped over, 
uh, once it's gone through an area, how does it then react and try to intelligently do that? And this is like... I don't know. I'd like to say it couldn't be done with ifs, but people always surprise me. Like, you probably could do it, but you shouldn't. Like, just because it works and you could have this huge, huge, huge program that's all these nested ifs and else ifs and this very rudimentary, like, no, that's, there's something more elegant that needs to be done. That's better scaling for design and better scaling for design where you step back and plan things out before you just jump in and start coding them. And then you can start fixing things as you go. So we need something that gives us a little bit more robust way to keep track of well what state is the robot in reacting and how should it transition between different states and modes of what is it thinking and what i'm presenting in this course and is used a lot in other Im embedded devices is the idea of finite state machines and this goes beyond just robotics itself and like a useful tool and even the basics of where computers come from if you look into alan turing and the turing machines and that theory and the idea that you could even have a machine that could simulate almost any action that a human or someone else could do to solve these actions but either way back to finite state machines so again when you're designing embedded systems and other robots like you'll probably have to come across setting up some kind of basic state machine at some point in time not everyone's going to need them but for something that's more complex than just quick reactions, um, yeah, you're generally going to need them. So here, a state machine is not a machine the same way that you think of a lawnmower or the robotics that we've dealing with it, but it's more of an abstract concept or system that helps us to systematically design and implement the logical behavior of an embedded system. And so knowing that when you're in one mode, you react this way and you'll transition to other modes, uh, depending upon current information that's coming in. Um, a smaller example could be this is just us as humans. Uh, right now, if you're being the student, um, you know, you generally you're going to react differently now that you're a student than, say, if you're an employee or if you're just at home. There may be blending of this, but if we just think of these states of, well, I'm a student, you know, I'm in class, I'm doing my work, I'm goofing off, I'm copying from Stack Overflow of the person next to me. Um, not looking and reading the material or watching the videos that are being made, uh, so forth. But um, you're doing that as a student. But then when you transition to work, you're probably like, oh, okay, I don't want to really think about school and I've got different tasks. And so you have the idea of that modes between student and school. And you got home where maybe you want to relax. And so we got student, school, and home. And oh, when you're transitioning, okay, I've got class, I'm at school. Okay, I'm a student time now. Okay, I'm doing work for my job or I've gone to my job. I've transitioned to my job mode. And, you know, those are set, say, based time of day and certain days of what you're going on. And so that idea of thinking that way, and we have to think this way with these more complex robots as we're working with them. So a uh, finite state machine, and abbreviated a lot of times as FSM, uh, or just talk about as a state machine. There's a whole larger area out there if you want to look into this, but we're just going to talk about finite state machines. It is a mathematical model of computation. So it abstracts a machine that can be exactly in one state of a finite number of states at any given time. So it's not like an infinite number of modes you can be in. There's a set in the very beginning that you could be, and at any point in time, you're only one state. So just like you could be a student and worker, say, at the same time. So you mean, this is more of like, no, okay, you're only student, then you're worker, then you're home, and you're not being multiples in between. And you have an example to the, to the left here. Uh, we'll be getting into which is this is a kind of a picture of a state diagram kind of chart which should, gives you a visual way to look at that abstraction of different states and things you're going through and when it would transition and specifically this one here is supposed to be for a line following robot so one that would be having sensors that try to pick up on things on the ground and it's just trying to follow a black line and there's only other white everywhere else and so it's trying to move and this one has a little bit of a learner to try to pick up and learn what it's doing as it moves around as well. So an FSM can change from one state to another in response to some kind of inputs from the actual environment. So the most, so something has been triggered and you only reach a certain state by going through a certain sequence of actual events over time. So the change from one state to another is called a transition. And FSM is defined by a list of states that you have, uh, its initial states, so the one that you start at, and the inputs that trigger each transition. 
And you can kind of see where they're labeled here and what can be transitions. I'll get into that more, but you know, you got the circles, you got the lines, you kind of got the markers on there. Now, even though it's an abstract concept, these are things that you've already dealt with in devices that you've seen every day. So the behavior of state machine can be observed in many devices in our modern society and perform predetermined sequence of actions depending upon a sequence of events uh, which they are presented. And so that's the kind of step up in kind of complexity for robots I'm presenting here. These are not machine AI learning something else kind of devices. This is now at least that it can do a predefined sequence of actions that it goes through depending upon the actual state and it'll keep changing. So some examples, uh, vending machines. Uh, you know, it's kind of different in the very beginning. You could be pressing buttons and doing stuff, but in that state where you haven't paid, it's not going to be doing anything else. So until you like put the coins in and it's detected that and it's the right amount of coins, then it's going to switch to instead of saying entering coins and accepting that for like what's happening is that for on the keys is like, okay, well, which selection do you want? And then it's going to know, okay, now you're pressing keys, it's going to know which selection, then it's going to be dispensing, making sure it's dispensed, so you hopefully don't go like ape shit crazy, and shake the whole machine, and then you're, okay, getting the actual thing, have, have they picked out what they've actually ordered, then going back to the original. So it's kind of a linear state in this one, and kind of very basic, but there's different cases of what you want to do, of keep asking them for the right amount of money, or the wrong choice, and so forth. Um, elevators, whose sequence of stops is determined by floors and requests by the riders. That's definitely a state of if it's going up or down, or which one it's going to go next to. Uh, traffic lights, uh, you know, as they go through each step, but also learning in between them all. Combination locks, that are more like the electronic locks you're doing, that require input in a sequence of numbers to get proper order to open this up. But... As always, before going on, I want to include a few videos so you can hear from someone else and get a few more ideas before we go further into this. So, you may have heard this phrase, finite state machine, before, but what exactly is it all about? A finite state machine is a method of modeling a system comprised of a limited number of modes. Depending on which mode it's in, the machine will behave in one manner or another. And while finite state machines can be used to describe items both natural and man-made, for historical reasons the term most commonly refers to computing systems. The concept was developed in the 1950s to describe early computers, which were often compared to their mechanical or electrical machine equivalents. Only later did people realize that finite state machines could be applied to a broader class of problems. Now, there are many ways of expressing finite state machines, though a graphical approach is often the one taken. State transition diagrams are one way to visually characterize a particular system. Let's explore how they work, using an oven's logic as an example. The modes in the machine are drawn as a shape, usually a rectangle or circle. This state transition diagram shows an oven that is off when no one is using it, or heating, when someone gets hungry and decides to bake cookies. Now usually when you plug in an oven, it doesn't immediately start baking. To reflect this behavior, the state machine starts in the off mode by default, which we indicate with an arrow. It turns out that any arrow you see in a diagram like this represents a transition. Arrows which connect one state to another are pathways that enable you to switch between them. The rule for when a transition takes place is displayed next to the corresponding arrow. In our example, the transition from off to heating happens when someone presses the oven's bake button, which we refer to as the baked pressed event. Similarly, we go back to the off state when someone pushes the off button. Now, once you turn an oven on, the heating element doesn't stay active indefinitely. When the oven approaches the desired temperature, the element cycles on and off to maintain that temperature. So, let's add a third state called idling which represents the situation where someone is baking, but the heating element is off. When the oven gets too hot, it goes to this idling state, and it returns to heating as the temperature drops and the oven gets too cold. Now, when you look at this diagram, you might see a slight problem with the logic. What's going to happen if you want to turn the oven off while the system is idling? Well, when the off button is pressed, nothing is going to happen in this situation because we lack the necessary transition to get us back to the off state. Therefore, we need to add another transition from idling to off with the appropriate event beside it. 
With that, we have a functioning oven prototype and have introduced the standard elements of a finite state machine when represented as a state transition diagram. The basic building blocks are states, transitions, and the events that serve as the rules for those transitions. Of course, things get more complex than this and we'll need to leverage other diagram concepts to represent additional details of an oven or other systems of our choosing. But for now, you've got the big picture. Okay. So that was a good first starting point uh, for us. That, um, let me actually bring myself up full screen for once. So that was a starting point for getting an idea of states. You can see the idea of the oven, something just a nice abstraction to deal with, but beyond the design of that is like, hey, well, where do you start being that off? And when you're off, there should be nothing heating and you just have ready waiting for settings. And then when the settings are put in and then bake is actually pressed, so being something that tri triggers is that it should go away from just being off to actually being on and actually heating up. And so when you're heating up, then you're acting differently. You're monitoring the actual temperature. So the idea is like, okay, well, it's idling, is that it's heating, 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 and once you reach the right temperature, well, you don't want to keep heating, so you should be going to idle, which just stays there and keeps checking until the temperature, if it drops below, and if it drops below, go back to actually heating. And then so forth, even from either one, is that if you have the off, going back to actually shutting down. And so you can kind of see where they start visually drawing it, notice something that was missing in the actual design and added it in. And the idea of, okay, well, this is the flow of what's going to happen, and the fact that there's different... Um, a kind of code or things that have to be executed or done within each state and you continuously stay into that state until there's another transition telling you that you need to leave and part of designing your robot as you grow larger. So I'll shrink myself back down and we'll go to part two of this same video just to expand upon it a little bit more. In this session, we will take a look at why finite state machines are useful to engineers, programmers, and scientists. It turns out that state machines are most valuable to systems with abrupt changes. If your system consists of nothing but continuous dynamics, with inputs that gradually change over time and system behavior that doesn't switch instantaneously, then you probably don't need a state machine. However, there are many great candidates out there, an ATM or cash machine being one of them because it deals with discrete input. ATMs rely on software that runs constantly and responds as a user presses buttons. How then would you go about writing code to respond to these instantaneous inputs? One programming strategy would be to write separate functions that determine what to do when a particular button is pressed. So when the user presses, say, the number 3, how should the system react? Well, we need to answer some questions to get this right. Did the person already swipe their card? If so, are they trying to enter their PIN? If not, are they entering the value of a withdrawal or deposit? If they aren't, what else could they possibly be doing? If you try to handle all potential situations where the number 3 is pressed, you'll end up with a long list of nested if, else if, else statements in your code, each one checking various internal and global variables in order to decide what to do. This approach will be challenging because you'll have to contend with every possible combination of variables. Even the most diligent programmer can make an oversight that would lead to missing or flawed logic. One way to drastically simplify things is to instead think about the ATM software as comprised of a fixed number of states. Each state can be conceived of as its own little universe, enabling us to more clearly define rules and desired behavior under a particular set of circumstances. So rather than contend with every possible outcome when a user presses 3, we can write concise code that handles swiping a card, entering a PIN, choosing a transaction type, and so on. In each of these states, there are fewer things that can happen when the user pushes 3. By compartmentalizing the problem into smaller segments like this, it is easier to satisfy our goals. These principles are, of course, valuable not only to cash machines, but to a wide array of problems. Aircraft, automobiles, and robotics are a few of the many fields that rely heavily on state machines to manage complex logic. So now that you know when to use finite state machines, what is the best way of expressing them? One approach is to write a requirements document that details all the different modes of operation and their expected behavior. However, this generally takes a lot of effort and does not necessarily convey interaction well. 
On the other hand, state transition diagrams display the system visually, which can make the connections between these states far more apparent. Once you understand the diagram's semantics, these pictures are indeed worth a thousand words. Of course, you can scribble diagrams on napkins to help you think through the early phases of design, but there are many computing tools available that help draft state transition diagrams. A number of these tools enable you to test the system in simulation and play out what-if scenarios. And if you're designing a finite state machine that emulates a software component, you can use these tools to automatically convert your diagram into code. What this means is that a state transition diagram can serve as a high-level starting point for a complex software design process. This can prove a far more effective development strategy than diving straight into writing thousands of lines of code. Okay. So with this video, I was really just trying to get someone else to bring in the same thing I'm trying to say is what they help you to do. So it's not going to be your first choice for everything you're doing for all projects. So as said, like you said, if it's discrete, quick changes versus continuous things you need to do. So this fits more into like one triggered event switches you to another. There's discrete changes of what's happening versus like just concrete kind of changes as you've coming in. And the point is it helps you plan out. So when you're dealing with a much more complex task, like the quick one of having a servo move based upon ultrasonic, that's very basic. That's an if. Um, even having very smaller cases I'm going to show coming up, they would work better just as if else's, but I'll be presenting them as first learning little tools before going to more complex. But as this individual here talked about, as well with an ATM, that's a much more complex embedded device that has to do a lot of things and kind of coordination. And so planning that out from the entire beginning and getting everything to coordinate together, like, again, you get these horrible huge if statement kind of Hudukin style nesting in as I like to call it um, that like just doesn't work and so you need a way to break it down into the specific states can be done and the combinations you expect and the transitions that you expect in between between well what am I doing now for this chunk of code and what has to happen next and so forth that this is a more complex actual structure and then for that designing is instead of spending forever on the code and tweaking stuff is thinking out overall, well, how will this device actually work and planning that out, testing it out and even using potentially tools as simulators to test out your idea before you go into physically implementing it. Uh, we won't go that far with simulators and tools. There are some out there that I've seen for visually actually setting up states and stuff you use to control with your Adreno. I just haven't played around with them enough yet and found one that's accepted community-wide that I want to go there. So we're going to go kind of smaller in-depth and see what's going on underneath with this design and kind of building from the steps up. And I'll be providing you with a basic template to go with. Okay. Now, before going on, I want to include one more video. It's from a different person. This is an older one from here, but that it talks about uh, looking at the robotic vacuum again in state machines. And my hopes is that you see like another step into the idea of why this would actually have to be designed when you're getting to something that's a little bit more complex that you're dealing with. You've seen these robots for cleaning your home. They wander around a room, vacuuming up dust. When they hit an obstacle, such as a wall or furniture, they turn to one side and then resume their wandering around. Sometimes they come across a particularly dirty spot. They stop and spin in place until that spot is clean and then go back to wandering around. Eventually, the battery runs low, in which case the robot makes a beeline back to its home charger and turns itself off. We can represent this as a kind of graph called a finite state machine. The robot starts off in a wandering state. At some point, it encounters an obstacle and transitions to a turning state. When the obstacle has cleared, it goes back to wandering. During the turn, it might encounter an obstacle again. We represent that with an edge that points back to the same turn state. When dirt is detected, it goes into a spin state and then returns to wandering. 
when that spot is clean. Finally, when the battery runs low, it enters a go home state, turning itself off when it arrives home. In a state machine graph, a circle, sometimes labeled, is called a state. Transitions are indicated with a directed edge and are also labeled. The initial or starting state is identified with an arrow pointing to it. The accepting or final state is drawn with a double circle or a thicker line. Finite state machines are usually labeled more simply. Let's use W for the wandering state and T for the turning state. The transitions will be labeled O and R. For the spin state, let's use S with D and N representing dirty and clean. For the go home, we'll use G and we'll use B to indicate the low battery condition. And then finally, arriving at home is H with off indicated with F. The final accepting state gets a double circle and the starting state gets an arrow pointing to it. And we just need to put in the last obstacle. What are some strings of events that represent valid cleanings? That is, can we come up with some sequences of events that result in the robot arriving home after cleaning the room? O-R-B-H is one such string. The robot would start in the W state, transition to the T state by following an O edge, and then transition back to the W state by following an, o, an R edge, then go to the G state by following B, and then finally to the F state by following H. BH alone is also a valid cleaning, although the robot doesn't really do much. Here's another one. O, 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 R, D, N, B, H. And also D, N, O, R, D, N, D, N, B, H. And so is D, N, D, N, O, R, D, N, B, H. What about O, O, R, D, B, H? In other words, what if the robot gets a low battery warning while it's cleaning up a dirty spot? Well, it probably ought to start going home immediately. Let's alter the state diagram so we include that transition. We'll draw an edge from the S state to the G state to indicate that if it gets a low battery warning while it's spinning around, it's gonna go immediately to the go home state. Here we have the state machine in a simulator. The states and transition edges are labeled as in my hand-drawn diagram. Let's try running some of those strings through it and see what happens. The first one I'm gonna do is ORBH. So when I press O, you can see the green circle transition from the W state to the T state. When I press R, it goes back to W. Then I'll press B, and we see it go to the G state. And then I'll press H and see it reach the F state where it is accepted. Let's try a longer one. We're going to do D, N, O, R, D, N, D, N, B, H. That one is also accepted. The third one, O, O, R, D, B, H. That one's an example of getting the low battery warning while cleaning a dirty spot. And the fourth one we're gonna try is O, R, D, N, R, B, H. So that one isn't valid. There isn't a transition from state W when the clear event happens. According to the state diagram, this isn't a valid cleaning. To fix this, we probably should have transitions from the W state to include these other possibilities. But let's summarize what we've gone over. A finite state machine is a directed graph. It consists of states, which are the vertices in the graph. Transitions are edges going from one state to another, possibly even the same state. One of the states is the initial state, and there are one or more accepting states. A finite state machine is said to accept a string if Evaluating that string from left to right 
starting at the initial state results in the machine arriving at the accepting state when the last symbol in a string is consumed. Okay, so there you got to see someone else kind of building, designing, and also testing out what they're doing in their actual design. So you can see one is that the state diagram gives you a visual way to represent how it should actually work. But then you can also then start testing and designing out what are possible sequences of events that your device could go through and then verifying if that works. And so here he was using a very basic simulator to see, okay, well, based on these inputs, will it transition properly? Now, this doesn't say what's code and kind of hookup is required in each state for, say, doing the cleaning and detecting when stuff's clean. Like, that's all the other work that would happen in that state. But it shows that, well, you know what to transition between these different states and what's going on. And then I found a few cases where, okay, this wasn't there properly. So how do I add in that behavior? And it's just as easy as adding a new transition. And this is all done before you go deeper into the actual code. That, you know, okay, well, everything happened in the sequence you expect. And when you're deeper into it, Will your embedded device be working properly? So, as I've said in the previous videos for all this, there's like this, you have the states generally being those vertices generally drawn as like circles uh, from right here, and they are connected and kind of waiting to execute uh, or waiting to transition between states uh, based upon certain conditions. Now. There are a lot of different specifications and ways that you can draw like state diagrams or going to UML or other ways. But here I'm not for this course, I'm not going to go that into you have to have a specific way it's drawn. Just this idea that, you know, states being these round or square kind of objects you can recognize and then arrows. So lines with arrows saying the indicated direction of a transition and then kind of text saying, okay, what is causing that actual transition itself? So you said here again, the transition is a set of actions to be executed when a condition is fulfilled or an event. So this doesn't mean things like say the enter or the left turn that there's nothing happening there. It means like, well, okay, for that left turn, there's code in there would be say turning the actual robot and it'll keep turning until one of the outgoing transitions is actually met. So here it says left turn and then there's an outgoing transition, say right up here. And there's an outgoing transition that says after 180 milliseconds. So that means it'll keep turning left, keep turning left, but also keep track of the time. And when we've hit 180 seconds, it'll stop turning left and it'll go back into the actual follow state. And you can see from the follow state that there's one and two different ways that it could go through uh, transitioning out and so forth. And we have our start state here in the actual beginning before going on. So in the idea in the, in the end in the code for each of these states, we're going to have code and things that are hooked up for dealing with what happens in there. And these transitions are going to be checking to see if certain things are met and then indicating, okay, well, we should not be in this state. We should be in this state now. And then letting it go back up and then come back down and say, okay, this is the state we should be working with. So. We're going to start here with these diagrams, designing it, and then I'm going to have full code examples that go from the diagram to specific code for the Adreno and examples that you can play with in the actual simulator. So an example to begin with for something just kind of abstract concept device to deal with, I will here, and it's an example I pulled from Wikipedia because I found it's a nice example and going into the actual state diagram. So a turnstile. So if we're thinking a turnstile to a subway system or something else, or to an amusement park that's supposed to restrict access until something indicates like a car or a coin or something indicates that you can go through that turnstile. So access is from here. So initially the arm is locked, blocking entry, preventing any patrons from going through. So depositing a coin or something else that indicates a payment of some choice. Um, and token in the slot and turn style. The arm will then be allowed to push forwards. And then after the customer goes through and the arm is pushed forwards from here, it'll then go back into an actual lock state. So you see the idea of everything connected together and the sensors and the information. So visually representing that as a state diagram, well, we've got this one here. And then we look, okay, first here's an arrow. So this should be the first state we start with. And in the lock state, uh, has one step versus what happens when pushing and going forwards. So we have two states of either the whole over type rod. So we're still just talking about this turn style here that's up there to the actual left. And so that turn style can either be that I'm locked or unlocked. 
in the beginning. That's part of in the design of what you're doing. So it's still a turnstile overall, but in one case, when I'm locked, I act a certain way when things are coming in, and when I'm unlocked, I react a different way. So with the two possible inputs that affect the states is either putting a coin in or pushing the actual arm. So these are actions or things that can be picked up by the sensors or whatever else to detect that there'll be transitions. And in the lock state, pushing on the arm has no effect how many times you actually do that. So that's stating right here is that, okay, if the transition is being a push, so it's detected that this matches up from here because either got push or coin as the outgoing to actual transitions. And so we've got to push, oh, come back here, stay in lock. So it's designed that the machine should stay in the lock state and do nothing else when we're right here um, at that time. Now putting a coin in is that giving the machine a coin input shifts the state from lock to unlock. So right here, following, okay, got a coin, it detected that, then the machine should be going into the unlock state and now start reacting in this way. So now in this case, when you get something that pushes it, Okay, well then I should be going back versus if I've got a coin coming in, okay, keep staying in the unlock state, in this case for design. But when you go to push, okay, go through here and I'm back to locked. And so now if there's another push after that, it's preventing the next person behind them or whatever, and that they should be paying or just jumping the turnstile. Yeah, because there's no jump the turnstile and like taser the person as they go through the turnstile to stop them. And some robotic overlords that are taking over the turnstile overlords. Uh, bad teacher joke of the year. So yeah, again, in the unlock state, like putting additional coins in has no effect over this. But so you can see the idea is that, well, okay, you always have push and coins, but you have to react in a different way based on what state you're in. And so really, it's kind of like just remembering that back to working, student, or at home, is that you'd react differently knowing based on your environmental actual inputs. Even though for some of you, it's uh, everything's the same right now. So designing an FSM for a basic robot, this can take a lot of time and like different ways and especially to a larger complexity nature of it. Uh, but you want to break down your basic task and I want to give you a basic kind of algorithm to follow yourself. Is step one, define what you want your robot to do. So write out the description plan. Well, I want it to do this. So you can write at a high level what you want to do. And then you should start trying to plan, think in your head, break it down to really what's the overall goal of what it does and what could happen as it does its work. Now, based upon when you write that out and you kind of got it planned out as kind of basic requirements, you don't have to go too detailed, but keep it somewhat general. Then you want to look through it and then start defining, well, what states do you see? So the overall rope is doing one thing, like moving forwards, turn left, turn right. What actions would it be in states would be depending upon different things that are going on. Uh, once you have those states listed out, give them a good descriptive name um, that's uniquely defined by each one. And then you should describe for yourself what happens in each state. So in this state, what work should it be doing while it's in that actual state? Uh, what things should actually be changing from there? And maybe start thinking about which states are connected to other ones. Which brings you to step four, which is draw the transitions. So if you have the states, like draw them out. Which ones are supposed to be connected in what order? And trying to think of what starts triggering that. Because then finally, you want to then draw in and say, well, what are the triggers that would affect that, that transitioning? So this has happened. What's the next step? So, you know, like ATM, they put their card in, should then transition to pin mode. Once they've got the right actual pin and that's verified, then it should go through to saying, well, what stacks, tasks they want to do? And then coming back and forth each task. Like you can think that way. So I'm going to go through a basic example here that then is fully worked out in the actual simulator video later on. And so here it's going to working up through these steps, getting up to the actual diagram. And then the simulator one will actually show the actual code for it and the actual device and everything hooked up. So what do I want to make? Well, I want to start by something small. When I got the Druna Uno, I don't want to go too complex in the beginning. And I want to make kind of like a step above a hello world example. Like I will have a hello world example for state machines that's very small, but I want this to be one step a little bit above that, that, that there's a bit more complex device like connections. So let's see the effectors and sensors and everything that's in it. And then like a few more extra steps. So, and it's kind of based upon the turn style, but adding a little bit more to it. So I want to design a small embedded device that controls a lock using a keypad. So that the user must enter a specific four key code. So one, three, two, four, that code specifically to unlock the device. And when unlocked, they must enter, uh, again, a four key code to relock it. So putting four, two, three, one. 
And now also at any time, if they enter the code 1234, the device changes from being a lock device into a hypnotic device, like a really incompetent hypno-robot toad that will not hypnotize anybody. Uh, and it will be emitting fancy lights or doing something along this. And in this mode, if you press 2, the machine will go back, will go to the lockdown the device. And if 3 is pressed instead, it'll go to the unlocked. So you're seeing something a little bit more complex here. And like I know like for a lock device, you wouldn't have a hypnotic thing. But I wanted to add in something, a flavor of fun into it. And kind of add in a more complex state than just that turn style coin and kind of two state transitions. I want to have at least three states and multiple different things that could be transitions coming out of this. And the fact that, again, you could do all of this with if statements, but then you've got to be controlling, okay, well, I've done a lock. Okay, once I'm unlocked, I'm going to unlocked, but I could go back to locked mode. But then also at any time while I'm in locked and unlocked, I could go into the hypnotic state. And when I'm in hypnotic, I could then go into back to the lock state or I could go back to the unlock state. And you got to go through all the combinations of what that could happen. And you're like, okay, how do you start designing that? And how do you leave this so it's versatile to add more states in the very beginning? Okay, so this is my basic write-up. And as I went through this, like I added a few more things or realized my design what I should add. But I'm still working through this process. So that's step one. Step two, define the states. So I have a device that's going to be locking. So I want to think, well, how is it going to be reacting differently? And the write-up here that I did specifically does make it easier to see the states is like, well, I've got devices, either it's locked or not locked. Again, that's so if I'm locked, one thing happens. So I have to wait for certain codes. And when I'm unlocked, I have to wait for other th other codes. But then I also have the hypnotic kind of state because when I'm in that, uh, it's not looking for a code to unlock or lock. It's then looking to control the actual lights and then uh, go either to the locked or unlocked and kind of managing two tasks at one time from there. So from this, I kind of see, okay, well, locked, unlocked, and hypnotic being my three states in my design. And that I want it to be locked automatically in the very beginning. And so I'm going to set that locked will be the starting state. Now, to, next to each one here on the actual right in the brackets here, I've just inc included what I'm going to use as the shorthand notation for the diagrams, just so we don't get these long texts in here. So an L, a U, and an actual H. So next from here, I want to describe the state. So in this state, what work should it be doing? And this is where I added like another little feature into each one. So while in the lock state, um, the lock should be engaged, you expect that, and waiting for a proper code entry. And so that being the 1324, but we'll see from here. Now it's in there. So now, and the light will be emitting a red to indicate that it's actually locked at this time. Now, unlocked instead is that the lock should be open and the light will be green. And then hypnotic is the light should be changing hypnotically from right here. And the lock should be unchanged from any previous state. So the idea here is that if it was coming from that we were in a lock state and we've gone to hypnotic, then the lock should still be locked at that time. Versus if we were in the unlock state and then we're coming back, we're going to the actual lock state, then it should still be unlocked and vice versa as you're expecting. So this is saying what should actually be done. Now next is to then draw the lines that are going in between each one. So one is first off indicating that you can see I've got my vertices. So L for locked, U for unlocked, and H for hypnotic. And then I've got the start. Now the color coding you're seeing here is not something you need to do. I just wanted to go back so you can see, okay, well looking at my description, what was I pulling out of that to get it to react? So you can see from the codes and stuff. And they're kind of keys that are triggering it, like into what triggers we should have. And so as you expect is that, well, from the whole description, it was saying, okay, I want to start in the lock state. When I'm in the lock state, if the right code is actually entered, I want to go to the unlock state from right here. And also, if I'm in a lock state, if we have the special code that says for hypnotic, I should be going down to the hypnotic state and so forth from here. Unlocked, write code in, I should be going back to the lock state. Special hypnotic code, I should be going to hypnotic code. And then down here for the hypnotic, once we're key from here, then it's going to keep doing its work. But either then we get that one code that sends us back to lock or the other code that sends us to actual unlocked.
And so you can kind of see these all flow of things that are happening here, but yet we don't have the triggers yet. So we know, okay, I've got each thing of what's supposed to happen as kind of sequence, and we can see it visually where things could transition, but we now need to add in what are the triggers that tell us when we should actually be transitioning. So from here, now we've added that in. So I've done the mark here, and there's gonna be more code you need to throw in to start detecting these things. But I've also like seen that, okay, well, going back a step is that I was missing some transactions, uh, uh, transitions I realized is like, well, what happens if I'm in a lock state and I get an improper code, what should happen? So not the right one that should unlock or go to hypnotic, what should it do? And so like I added in here that, okay, well, if there's the wrong code, should stay in the lock state. Uh, if I'm in the actual unlock state and I get a wrong code, same thing. I should stay in the unlock state. And hypnotic, I should stay in the hypnotic state if I get the wrong code. Now, you don't always need to have these. It's just conveniently worked out for mine because each one was looking for codes. And if it was the wrong code, what should actually happen? And just to visualize that, I've added in by the actual lines. Now going to the transitions themselves, you can see marking here is ring wrong code, wrong code, wrong code. And those are going to be different checks for each one of these. But now for this transition, this is where they've entered in the keypad the sequence of 1, 3, 2, 4. So if I get that transition, I should go over here versus if they put a 4, 2, 3, 1, should go back. And again, I just picked these arbitrarily and kind of built it in. But you can now see the same transitions goes down here or 3 or 2. So we have a visual way to see everything from what we've designed before. And we also have a way now to start planning out what are sequences of events that could be happening and will we have everything happen in the right way. Like we could start testing it and planning out, okay, well, machine starts up. I'm in the lock state. The user enters then one, three, two, four. Okay, then I should be transitioning over to here. They then enter a wrong code. So say two, 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 two. And so that should be going back to here. Then say another wrong code, three, 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 three. They should be going back to here. They then enter say one, two, three, four. Okay, then I should be transitioning down to here. And from here, then waiting for the codes, the hypnotic lights and everything are running. We're staying within this state. They then press three. Okay, we should be going back up to here. And then we can go four, two, three, one, which the transition is to the lock and kind of keep going through. So we can plan and think, is this everything we want our robot to do and plan out and test the actual sequences? But we have captured the idea of what we want the robot to do, all the actions it needs to do and we've planned it out in this visual way. Next, we just need to actually implement this and turn this state diagram into the actual code itself, which I've got coming up. So there are many different ways to implement the state machines and code, such as a directed graph. So something, if you're dealing with in the data structures course, you probably didn't touch, or if you did touch upon it, uh, you could start implementing these things, and it may work for larger scale things, but we're going to go smaller. We're dealing with the Adrenos, and like it's not like a massive amount of actual computation versus a microprocessor like um, in uh, the uh, Raspberry Pis that you could work with. So we'll go with a basic implementation using variables and switch statements uh, to keep track of where we're doing and what we should actually be executing it. Okay. So I'm providing a basic structure here. There's lots of different implementations online and I've provided you with a basic blank template for you to start with that I'll be showing you later on that you can copy and work with the actual code itself. But the first idea here is that in the global section work on Adreno, you should uh, define each state as an individual constant or as an enumeration or enum. So this is a new data type that you may or may not have worked with in Python. I don't think in Python, but in Java or C++. And I'll be showing you how you can do this in the actual Adreno in the example code. Um, and you want to, like, the order of these doesn't matter. You just have to have that they're uniquely identifiable. That you have some way to uniquely identify each state itself in the very beginning and listing them out and using good names or descriptive. And uh, then you also want to find a variable that holds the current state. Because the idea is that you've got this abstract idea of the states, but you're only ever in one state at a time. And so you have to have a variable that's holding the state. So it'll be the same data type as whatever your 
uh, constants for all your states are, and you'll generally set it to being whatever the start state is. And the idea is that we're always going to be checking what this variable is and which state it is, and based upon that, executing the specific code that should be happening, and then checking the specific transitions that we should expect, and then changing it based, changing that one variable to be the state that we want to transition to or not. So an example here, and you'll see this in the code, is this is how you define enumeration enum. So it's just a way, to, it's, it's a consistent way to make a list of actual constants that will have a consecutive, consecutive number assigned to them without you having to type all this out. And in Java and other languages, there's more to them. But for the basic one we're working with is that you would just go enum. I'm, you can call this whatever your type, but we're just call it state for right now. It's kind of a data type is what you're defining right here. And then you're saying this data type can have these types that are in there. So state one, state two, separated by commas, you have the semicolon. And you'll just keep adding in all the states as you actually want to go. And then you can define your variable that holds the current state. So you use state matching to the name you gave here for your new data type you're creating the name equals and then this could be just directly any one of these here with the exact same spelling and capitalization as what you're seeing in here to say what state you're actually starting with so again this is just a list of all the states and we have each individual number assigned to them automatically by the compiler and then right here is then setting your start state in this variable that will be used and checked at all times to see which state are you in. So you check that and then you execute the code that you want to have in that state. Now the rest of the structure, you're going to generally have this in the loop section and you want to break this down into other functions and stuff to make it more readable so your like, loop doesn't just become this massive chunk of code. It's nicer to keep break down the code some and I've done that in other examples. So here you'll define a switch statement that use the current state so you know switch instead of having an if else kind of large ladder you can use a switch which just does the same kind of individual checks on your variable that you create in step one uh, you have a case statement for each state and then in each state case you put in code that should be executed for that state and generally you're not you don't want to do again where it's blocking like well that's depending on design so blocking being that nothing else happens until that code's done usually you're doing one little iteration for what should happen in that state and come back unless you want it to block and ignore all other inputs until you actually come back so it depends upon what you're actually designing uh, after that code then you want to have code that's checking information that you have so other global variables or sensors or things to check for the actual transitions you expect and the changes to that current state and the idea is that this will keep going on is the idea is that you have run a little code once it finishes that case you go back down it loops back up and it once again checks to see what is the current setting of that state variable and if it's changed it's going to go to a different case statement which is in effect doing our transition to another state itself so here is some example code so being a statement. So you, in this case here, I've set it up that I have a run state machine, which is just going to run one of the states itself. And that's in the loop and it's continuously being executed. It's because it's the loop function, how it works. We have the switch statement, the current state, and then having each individual case you're working with, the code you want, and any transition uh, code you're having here. And this can all be kept in kind of a blank function if you want and that kind of break to end your case so the idea is it's going to go and come in check the state run this code finish here exit come back up and kind of repeat this process so in here if you've changed the current state variable it means when it leaves and then comes back it's going to go and start running the next code you expect and so we would have planned this all out in our state diagram and then come back to it <coughs> and implemented it here so uh, one example then I have up in the Tinkercad simulator and I have the code posted already as well. Here is just a blank version. So this link here is just directly to a blank version of it. So let that load, then I will bring it up. Boom. Okay. So as I wait for this to load, this one doesn't do anything. Like there's not actually accomplishing anything. It's just the blank code that if you're using a simulator and you want to start with the state machine, you can either copy and paste this or you can make a copy of this as your starting simulator. So if we open up the code here, go a little bit bigger and increase it. 
is that you see once again, like I just have it as the blank code here. So the state one and state two can take out. This is just as placeholders that you can start putting in what states you want. And I've got another example after this, which actually does it. Uh, in my code here, I've also included some debugging to make it easier to read. And the one way I've set it up here is that in this array that you see here, this has been initialized, you then should have what string should be outputted for this state. So I've got state one. When I'm outputting any information about it, it's going to print state one. And you want to do this in the same order. Because the idea is that this is going to be given a constant value of zero, then one, then two, then three, then four. And so I want it to match up with the index of this array here. So you change give it whatever name you want here and give it here is the name you want to actually output it. This variable I've set up here is for the entire program is that I've made specific uh, one function for kind of debugging and printing out messages. And so you can toggle it on and off. So true to have it print stuff out, false for it to not. Quickly state here and then you have that variable that we're using to keep track of our actual state. And you can see it here is that for this example code, I just have it always here saying current state, which will then also print out what is the actual current state you're on. So this will, for the, you can take this out when you're designing yourself so you just don't see this repeated forever. And I've got that in future examples. This is just for this one here. And then you've got the actual run state function I talked about before. Here is the print debug method that I talked about. So this one here just has the debug. And then it first has the code to get the kind of time uh, we haven't gone into that, that Adrenos don't have a built-in clock that can keep track of what the current time is. All it has is the time since the actual Adreno started up, and it's what's called clock ticks. So basically clock being every time it's executing an instruction. And so this is just getting the current time and then outputting it, it and then output saying what's the current state, getting the name that you defined in that array in the very beginning, and then outputting it, and then whatever message you want. So just to help out if I'm in this state, and these are the messages I'm getting if you're trying to track down what's going on. Then you have the run state machine, and in this case, I've broken stuff down. And this one is that the code that's supposed to be run for it is in a function that's called, and then changing a transition afterwards. So here, this one doesn't do any checking for change in transition. It just automatically, if I'm in state one, do my action, then automatically go to state two. So it's like state one, run, go to state two. State two, run, go to state one. Going back and forth. This is just like a basic hello and printing out that message. And then here, just have it printing out a message and then delaying for a second to make this actually visual. So if you were to do this, uh, you again wanna just change these states, change the information that's here, change the actual start method you have there. And then for each of your states, have an individual case. And then I would suggest having all the code you have for this in separate functions. So this run state one, run state two, that can just be deleted and you, you change it to be functions that represent each of your states. And mainly doing that's just so that this doesn't grow huge as a function and hard to understand what's going on. And then it's much easier to find, okay, this is all the code for dealing with that one state. And even the transitions is in one function. So you can zero into the one thing that you're working on and even potentially just test that function by calling it. Uh, without the actual state machine itself. So when you first open this up, again, you want to see anything you want to open up the serial monitor. So I will just move this to the side. Having the Adreno visible is not exactly the most important thing. And I'll just increase the serial monitor and just start running the simulation. And for some reason, while I am recording this, it doesn't really want to output a lot of stuff. That is okay. I will come back to this in the simulator video. It may be my recording software that's causing some issues. Okay. And I'll talk about these again. So now here's another example where I've taken it and I've just done now example where it's using a photoresistor. So if we're looking at this state diagram, it's a night day thing that's going to change an LED based upon the light settings. You could do this with an if else statement. You don't really need a state machine for this, but I intend this as being your hello world of state machines with sensors. 
is that it just reacts quickly and there's only two states it's very small to start with whereas you want to keep growing this and get a little bit bigger and in the simulator video i'll be showing that with the kind of lock example as i built that so reading this again you can see okay well okay start okay this is when we're here d for day and for night so we're starting in day uh, and here that means that the red light should be off and the green light should be on and the idea is yeah so here that for night is the red lights on and the green light is off so it's switched from right here and the idea of the transition is that a reading from the photoresistor if it's less than 800 if we're in the day state we get one less than 800 then it should go over here tonight if it's greater than or equal to 800 we're just going to stay in here and then when we're at night if it gets anything greater than or equal to 800 then it'll transition back to day which will change these actual leds so i will bring this up again So you can see the photoresistor with that voltage divider we've had before, and we've got the two LEDs hooked up and hooked up to pins four and three, and we have the photoresistor hooked up to the actual analog input. If we open up the code here now, <coughs> you can see where, again, got my normal constants to make it readable for where all the pins are. I've got my states changed to being day and night. I like to keep it all capitals, just my habit for constants. Then in the actual array here that's used for outputting stuff, I have the day night in the same order that's here and in the way that I want it to be printed out. My usual setup mode right here, the Boolean, you can see me setting the current state to be the day state. That's the one I wanted to start with. And then for each one state we have now here, you can see a day, I've got night. And in my case, I've just broken up this one that the transition code is here. So this code could be inside the run day one state. I've got another example, but here I thought it was small enough. I'll just separate them that this is what should happen in the run day state. And then this is the code for checking for the actual transition. So if you remember from the diagram, so run state is that in the day state here, we should have the first pin here. So that first LED is on, the other one is off. And then I'm just having it delay here in the case for the simulator not to go crazy. Uh, here next is, well, we're doing analog read knowing that we have the photoresistor on here and this is where we're checking. Okay, have we triggered that change to a new state? Okay, oh, it's less than 800. Okay, that we should be moving uh, moving to day, oh, I've put stuff, yeah. So I should be moving to the actual night state and I realize this right now, so I'll change it live. Moving to night state and then moving to day state. My bad for the output not fixing that before this time. So here is we have it that gave us less than 800 for in day, which is what we have happening here. We've got the transition then, okay, the reading we've got is less than 800. Then we change the state to being night and we leave. Because the idea is that the next time we go up to the actual loop function, it's gonna print out the current state, come back to here, come down, okay, check current state, then we're gonna go into the night state which does next. And again, while we still don't have these readings, so if it's anything that's greater than or equal to 100, we won't go into this if, we'll go down here, and current state won't be changed, so when we come back up, we'll still be in day state, and we'll keep coming back and executing this code continuously. And night state, you see the off opposite of this one transition. So it's kind of what you can expect of that you have code that's supposed to be run while you're in that state and what you expect. And then you have code that's checking for your transition. So this is where you'll have ifs and kind of things and whatever combination you expect of internal variables or states. It depends upon what you're actually designing itself. And so this one is still very basic. Let's run this one and see how it works this time again here as well. So get this going. up here and click start simulator okay and let's get let's see okay should not have done these in this video and now it's recorded forever so i will come back to these in the simulator video when i don't have a whole bunch of other things running and that everything should be working fine because trust me these do actually work 
So I will stop this here. I will come back to these two examples, so the blank state example and the actual night and day sample when we get to the simulator videos and I have less other things running on my computer. From here we've reached the end of these notes and always I want people to remember to take care of yourself. We're getting further into the semester now and usually this is a very stressful time of year and you should be taking steps to make sure that you are doing okay and if you're not please reach out to someone please check on other people and if it's in this course please reach out to me if you need extra help or extra time to work on things these things always can be worked out all i appreciate is some actual honesty that's all i ask for other than that i will stop from here and you guys can go on to the simulator video